or was I? These are not the firebenders you're looking for. I'm not even kidding when I say that everything I showed at the end of the last episode was the montage of them taking back all of the Earth Nation. That was it. All of it. And almost immediately, Katara gets back into giving exposition. The scroll we had was proven to be helpful. Ong was practicing, but for some reason, he was having trouble with waterbending. Except that he didn't. In fact, he quickly surpassed Katara, causing a whole rivalry conflict throughout the episode with the pirates. Remember those pirates? No, it's because we didn't get any pirates! By this point, word of the Avatar's return has reached the Lord of the Fire Nation, and Commander Vague Statements is here to advise him. They describe him as just a boy. We should set a trap for this person. We have many Earth Kingdom people under our control. I can leave soldiers hidden in certain locations. We're then treated to easily the best bit of acting in the entire movie as Zuko explains his banishment and need to capture the Avatar. I'll show you why we must, Uncle. Hey. Hey. Little one. Come here. You look like a very smart boy. Tell me what you know about the Prince. The Fire Lord, son. He did something wrong. He spoke out of turn to a general in defense of some of his friends who were going to be sacrificed in a battle. Then Prince Zuko was sentenced to an Agni Ki duel. An Agni Kai! Then the father burnt his son to teach him a lesson. Catch him soon, Uncle. Then we can think about the pretty girls. So, after consulting Sokka's map, Aang decides to travel alone to the Northern Air Temple, hoping to have another vision and learn more about his quest. Here, he flies simultaneously into three separate episodes once again. I'm beginning to notice a pattern here. In the cartoon, the group is shocked to find a group of refugees has taken the Air Temple as their living space. Here, they meet a father and son team of inventors, which play a vital role near the end of the series. In the movie, upon landing, Aang is greeted by an old man who leads him into a chamber containing statues of all the previous avatars, something that was actually present in the first Air Temple in the show. Aang then explains some obvious setup for the end of the movie, in which he refused to take up the mantle of the avatar by not bowing. There's a ceremony when everyone bows to me. when I accept my role as the Avatar. But when everyone bowed... I didn't bow back. Something that was in no way present in the show whatsoever. Before he is quickly betrayed and captured by Fire Nation troops. This then bleeds into a third episode in which Commander Zhao commandeers a Firebender base and its legendary archers, who are found to be so skilled that they are actually able to capture the Avatar. Of course, none of that actually happens in the movie, he just simply surrounds him by troops in a tiny room and he surrenders off screen. Commander Zhao then shows up to gloat about his trap, blah blah blah. But what's this? It's. the worst ninja I've ever seen! So after murdering a guy, this mysterious man frees the Avatar before leading him directly into a courtyard full of guards! Look out guys! He's got a stick! Stay back! Don't try to overpower him or anything! He's got a stick! So while the mystery ninja is off fighting for his life, Aang finds himself in some sort of practice area that has nothing to do with the show. Admittedly, on its own, this actually seems like a cool concept, if they did anything with it. Instead, Aang just seems to do a lot of posing, while almost nobody attempts to stop him. He then jump cuts his way free, deciding to return and help the Mystery Man, known in the show as the Blue Spirit. They fight for a while before Zhao suddenly appears. Do not kill the Avatar! He will just be reborn again! Great going there, buddy. Open the gates. Do it. 
Oh hey, it's one of those amazing archer guys that were never established in the movie, making this seem like a hilariously impossible shot. But what's this? The blue spirit is really... <gasps> Zuko! Dun dun dun! Then, deciding to save the guy he's only seen once, making this decision far less dramatic than it was in the show where Zuko had been a constant threat, Aang luckily has all the time in the world to very slowly summon Fog to cover their escape due to the conveniently long bridge. Later, somewhere in the woods... Good work there, cameraman. Very stealthy. And now we have a deep character moment as Aang questions if under different circumstances the two could have been friends. Before the war started, I used to always visit my friend Kuzan. The two of us, we get in and out of so much trouble together. He was one of the best friends I ever had. And he was from the Fire Nation, just like you. If we knew each other back then, do you think we could have been friends too? At least that's what would happen if they had any backstory in the movie at all. Instead, Aang just leaves Zuko unconscious in the forest, and climbs away for reasons beyond me. Zhao then brings news of an unfounded and completely out of nowhere accusation. I fear that your son is not only incompetent, but also a traitor. Of course, I cannot prove this, sire. You think my son is this person the soldiers are calling the Blue Spirit? Yes. I'd like to imagine the director being pleased with this weirdly long pause in delivery. Zhao's men were searching the coast looking for you. They also searched the ship. I told them you went on a vacation with a girl. Where were you for the past four days? So, let me get this straight. Within four days, Zuko managed to learn of Zhao's plot to capture the Avatar, despite not having been shown to have any contacts within the Fire Nation, and remember the last time we saw him, he was just kind of hanging out in Earth Nation City for reasons never explained to the audience. But he then also managed to learn the location, travel by himself from the ship that was at the coast to the mountains, find an over-elaborate disguise, learn the layout of the Air Temple turned prison well enough to sneak in completely undetected, and walk all the way back from where Aang left him in the woods. So, what I'm gathering from this is that Zuko is really Batman. Also, Zhao was able to come to the conclusion that the ninja was Zuko and send troops out to find him before Zuko even made it back to the ship, leading me to believe that Aang left him unconscious in the woods for potentially days. Our hero, everybody! And then this. Do not harm my son. Leave him to his isolation. You are so fucking fired. So not only did Zhao jump to the conclusion that the blue spirit was Zuko without any proof, seeing as nobody but Aang saw his face, in fact Zhao hadn't even seen or spoken about the prince since he made fun of him back on his ship at the beginning of the movie. But he then presented this accusation to the lord of his nation, who told him to leave Zuko alone. He then proceeded to send troops to Zuko's ship to sabotage it, all before Zuko was even able to make it back to his ship. So even if Zuko had left his ship and the entire scene at the Air Temple prison had taken place in only one day, it's still really unlikely that he'd have managed to do all the rest of this in only three. Especially taking into account that since Zuko's in exile, he's not part of the Fire Nation and tends to just wander around looking for the Avatar. And they're not tracking his location. At least they weren't in the series. But even if they did want to do that in the movie, it seems really unlikely since technology such as radios or GPS don't even exist in this universe yet. Meaning they not only had to track Zuko's ship down within three days, but had to know exactly when he was going to arrive in order for it to explode within minutes of his arrival. Because as we see, Uncle Iroh was feeling fancy and was getting a pedicure outside the whole time. And just look at the trap! It's just a broken pipe blowing on an open flame. There are just so many reasons this doesn't make sense. First off, someone would have to actually be hiding on the ship waiting for Zuko's arrival to set up the timing of such a rudimentary trap like this. There's no way the pipe would have known right when Zuko showed up to ignite itself. 
And secondly, besides that, in order for this trap to work, someone would have had to let that pipe spew gas into the ship for quite a while to have enough to ignite that big of an explosion. Because if the pipe had just been broken left spewing on this open flame, the worst you'd have is a long stream of fire shooting out of a pipe. But that plan still wouldn't work if you had left the room to fill up with gas because somebody would have had to go in there and ignite that torch, which would have just set the whole trap off. And we can't assume that Zuko set off the torch because, as we've established, firebenders can't create fire in this movie. And even if he had, he would have exploded instantly. And even then, it seems really unlikely they would have had a chance to fill this room with gas without someone accidentally igniting it, because, as we can see, there's a second bed here, so somebody else sleeps in this room. Unless Uncle Iroh here had just really had it with Zuko snoring or something. And on top of that, the only hint we really have that this entire thing was even an assassination attempt is a voiceover of the Fire Lord telling Zhao not to go after Zuko. It's never addressed or mentioned at any other point in the entire movie. So I, for one, like to think this was all the result of incredibly terrible plumbing. By the way, in case you're curious, in the show, this was done by those pirates who keep not being in this movie. No, I won't let that go. They did it better, too. Meanwhile, the trio has managed to make their way to the Northern Water Tribe using their off-screen powers. Uh, come up with your own jokes. I got nothing. And as soon as they arrive... Oh hey, Katara's completely unnecessary narration is back. Boy, how we missed you. My brother and the princess became friends right away. Oh yes, just look at that connection. Truly, they are destined to be together. Yay. Also, more random flailing. Seriously, does anyone actually think these actions fit with what's going on? Like, at all? Anyone? Ugh. I must assign a guard to be with you at all times, Princess. Your presence is our inspiration. I'll do it. That's me, I'll be her guard. Nothing will happen to her. I had a feeling you might volunteer. Well, you've only been in one shot of one scene together, and you haven't shown any level of loyalty towards the Princess or our nation, and we haven't seen your combat abilities whatsoever. But, you know, she is only our Princess. I like the cut of your jib. You got the job. Also, shock of shocks, in the series, the budding relationship between Princess Yue and Sokka was actually given a chance to develop. Realistically starting with Sokka awkwardly trying to win the princess's affections... So it looks like I'm gonna be in town for a while. I'm thinking maybe we could... do an activity together? Until a real relationship formed. Then there's that whole betrothed to another guy she doesn't actually care for thing. It also made the decision for Sokka to be picked as the protector of the princess make way more sense, and it wasn't even his idea. But who needs that when you've got love at first narration? Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, the Fire Lord orders Zhao to kill the spirits of the moon and the ocean because it gives the waterbenders their powers. Not only is this incredibly stupid, disrupting the balance of an entire planet to destroy a single city of maybe a mile in diameter, but in the series, this was actually the idea of Zhao himself, with nothing leading to the Fire Lord even having knowledge of this plan. In fact, he's told repeatedly by everyone who hears the plan that it's stupid. Zhao, the spirits are not to be trifled with. Yes, yes, I know you fear the spirits, Iroh. I've heard rumors about your journey into the spirit world. And only the Avatar can go speak to them. This only seems feasible for this character to attempt due to an incredible ambitiousness and arrogance that had been built up through an entire season. This is the year the Fire Nation breaks through the walls of Ba Sing Se and burns the city to the ground! Here, this guy's only been on screen for, what, 10, 15 minutes tops? Do you have a personality for him? I don't. And now, through rigorous weeks of off-screen training, we see that Aang has apparently become rather adept at waterbending. Good thing they didn't show us any sort of training. We wouldn't want to see any sort of character arc or progression going on there, would we? Also, this guy? Sexist jackass who refused to let Katara train and threatened to do the same to Aang if he helped her in any way. 
because his fiancée, who turned out to be Katara's grandmother, left him. I can understand that not being really necessary for the plot, but just food for thought. But enough about that, it's time for awkwardly delivered exposition. But I warn you, <laughs> my grandmother will ask you a lot of questions. What might she ask me? Well, she'll say, why is your hair white, young lady? You look very odd. I would say to you, grandmother, my hair is white because when I was born, I was not awake. My mother and father could not get me to make a sound or move. So they prayed for days to the moon spirit and dipped me into the sacred waters. My parents said that my hair turned white then and life put into me. Oh yeah, by the way, the uh, princess contains a piece of the soul of the moon, but I'm sure that's not important. It probably won't even come up later. The golden dragon dance? But who am I gonna ask? Suki or Princess Yue? I saw him first. Don't make me use my moon powers on you. Add another point to the why the hell are they letting Sokka protect this girl list. After watching the first hour or so of this movie, some fans might feel they've noticed a bit of a difference between the film and television versions of some of these characters, like Sokka here, for example. Let's just take a moment to compare and contrast, shall we? Here we've got our TV version. Can your science explain why it rains? Yes! Yes, it can! She was right, after all. I hate you. It's okay, Sokka. That's how Sokka started yesterday! Now look at him! He thinks he's an earthbender! Take that, you rock! And over here, we've got our film version. Just stop doing that stuff around me. I always get wet. I'll do it. That's me, I'll be her guard. Nothing will happen to her. <laughs> Katara! Hmm. I don't see a difference. We have arrived at the northern water. Oh, that's right. I just remembered the one difference there is. What's it called? Um, everything. How do you take the goofy, awkward, but lovable klutz of Sokka and turn him into this lifeless robot? And our title character Aang has gone from this fun-loving child in over his head to this uptight, saintly, slightly different robot. At least Katara was always kind of uptight in the series, but that was in more of an overly mature, motherly sort of way. But even then, you still had, you know, emotions. There's also supposed to be a love subplot between Aang and Katara, but I don't think there's a movie in the world long enough for that to happen since it took days of travel for Katara to even ask Aang's name. Probably the most faithful character we have here is Zuko, and probably the best acted too. But he's not really all that important in the narrative of this film. Not to mention his non-existent relationship with his uncle. But I digress. Back to the crummy movie. The lovely day is then suddenly interrupted as black snow begins to fall. Anyway, the Fire Nation is here. In the series, Sokka was able to discern that this was coming from the Fire Nation due to the soot from the ships mixing in with the falling snow. But that was because he witnessed the same thing in the Southern Water Tribe just before Zuko arrived. In the movie, uh, Batman? Where are they? By the way, Zuko's still alive and completely unharmed. Hooray! Way to ruin any sense of tension for that thing that happened less than ten minutes ago. Woo! Now be sure to keep your uniform closed up to your neck. And remember, your chi can warm you. I know, Uncle. Remember, Zuko, use that thing that has never even once been mentioned in the movie. Or in the series. It wouldn't just make sense to say Breath of Fire like in the cartoon. Firebenders using fire is just too foreign a concept. People won't grasp it. Continuity. So Aang decides he needs to find a spiritual place to meditate and talk to the dragon spirit. I can meditate. There is a very spiritual place. The city was built around this place. Then, while Aang is trying very hard to concentrate, Katara decides to give him a pep talk that makes absolutely no sense in the context of the scene, but is obvious trailer fuel. I knew you were real. I always knew you returned. Why is he sitting like that? He 
he's meditating, trying to cross over into the spirit world. It takes all his concentration. Is there any way we can help? How about some quiet? When they're interrupted by... <gasps> it's the ninja... Wait, weren't you wearing white like 30 seconds ago? It's at this point that in the series we have a face-off between the experienced firebender that's been a looming threat throughout the entire series and chased them halfway across the planet and the newly trained and equally skilled Katara. Fire versus water. Rage versus control. The fight of the century! At least that's how it would be if this wasn't only the second time these people had ever even seen each other in the movie. My name is Katara, and I'm the only waterbender left in the Southern Water Tribe. So, Zuko kidnaps Aang and decides the most intelligent place to hide is some random building in the city that's currently under siege. Yeah, I'm sure the military force that came here looking for someone of world-altering importance won't bother to check those houses. Meanwhile, Aang is busy taking a stroll through the spirit world. In the series, this consisted more of an adventure, running into quirky characters until he finally locates his previous incarnation, who instructs him to visit a spirit named Ko. You must be very careful to show no emotion at all. Not the slightest expression, or he will steal your face. Instead, in the film, he simply walks down a nicely lit path to the cave of a dragon that has never talked throughout the entire series, who tells him that he sucks and he needs to get over it. After that's over, Aang wakes up to Zuko attempting to have a character moment, pouring out his heart and soul about the hardships of his life and how capturing Aang will change all of that. But Aang has no time for this. He has wire food to be doing. Outside, the Fire Nation is finally getting around to using those machines that Sokka warned us about, and invading the city on giant lizard creatures that seem jarringly out of place with the lack of interesting mystical creatures that we've seen so far. I mean, we've seen Appa, Momo, and a dragon, and that's it. Anyways, back to the plot. You can't be serious. It's at this time that I feel the need to point out that Zuko and Aang never actually had a battle like this. Not only did Zuko get his butt kicked by Katara, twice. but his big climactic fight was actually with Commander Zhao himself. So after a bit more fighting, Katara shows up to aid Aang, deciding to remove Zuko from the plot by flat out killing him. Luckily for him, Aang has a conscience and decides to allow him to simply die of hypothermia instead of suffocation. Uncle Iroh and General Zhao finally enter the city, using a scroll from the Great Library that earlier needed deciphering, but apparently is just a map to follow. This is a scroll from the Great Library. This is our map. Aang somehow recognizes these two men, whom he's only seen once as they pass through a crowd. Realizing the importance of stopping them, he sends Katara, Sokka, and the princess away while he's off to go do more wire food. So while all that's going on, Zhao and Iroh have managed to find their way to the Moon Spirit and capture it. What are you doing here? Stop, Zhao! The world will go out of balance. Everyone will be hurt. The Fire Nation is too powerful to worry about children's superstitions, General Hero. Commander Zhao, don't. We are now the gods. In the film, while they were still on the ship, Zhao very blatantly told Iroh of his plan. Why should you not be worried about the moon's power? Because your brother Fire Lord Ozai and I have decided it is in our best interests to kill the moon spirit. What? If Iroh felt so strongly against it, why did he calmly wait on the boat and walk all the way here before even attempting to do anything about it? And secondly... If Zhao thinks this is a silly child superstition, then why is he bothering to even do it? Anyways, stabby stab, and just like in the series, with the death of the moon spirit, the sky goes red and the waterbenders lose their abilities. 
And then the biggest slap in the face of the fans that's been culminating since the beginning of the movie finally comes to a head. Not only did they change how firebending works, they decided to make it a plot point that someone who can conjure fire out of nothing exists. Which, of course, amounts to absolutely nothing other than scaring a few firebenders out of the cave. The movie never even attempts to explain this. My only guess for this is that in the original series, they hinted that Iroh has actually visited the spirit world, which, remember, is completely impossible. And then they use this as the logic for his unusual firebending abilities. However, like I said, the movie doesn't even bring this up, so the typical moviegoer is left without an explanation. Just like in the series, Iroh notices something unusual about the princess and explains that she can give her life back to the spirit who saved her as an infant. Accepting the responsibility, the princess gives up her life and becomes the new Spirit of the Moon. It's at this point that the end of the film deviates drastically from the original series. Shocking. I know. The fight between Prince Zuko and Commander Zhao almost happens, as Zuko gets the drop on Zhao, planning to fight him. While his uncle looks on and apparently reads lines from a completely different script. He wants to fight you so he can capture you, Zuko. Walk away! Look at this guy. Does he look like he's prepared to kick your ass and take you prisoner? I remind you that it was actually Zuko who snuck up on and challenged Zhao. The general here looks like he's going to need new pants in a minute. The fight almost ensues when Iroh steps in, stopping it before it even starts, and then walks off. Then, four random, never-before-seen waterbenders show up and flat-out murder Zhao in the most gruesome way they could get away with. Bye, you weren't very well written. After looking like a badass ballerina for a little while, Aang finally gets around to enacting the climax of the film. Now, as I said, the film's ending deviates drastically from the original series. In the cartoon, once the moon spirit had died, Aang merges with the ocean spirit, rising out of the water as some sort of massive liquid fish of doom! And once the moon had been restored, Aang was released, and the ocean itself decided to kill Zhao in a kid-friendly, off-screen sort of way. Here, Aang shows off his amazing Avatar abilities by summoning a massive wall of water, the likes of which the world has never seen! The sight of this act alone causes all the fighting in the city to come to a halt as they stare in awe. So, what does the Avatar do with this amazing power? How does he strike the mighty liquid hammer of justice down upon the invading soldiers and their navy? by daintily dropping it back down, so delicately that the ship that was directly against the wall is hardly even affected by the waves. What? You wanted something awesome to happen? Well, you're watching the wrong movie, my friend. Now, I'm assuming they didn't go with the giant water monster of doom for reasons of budget. I really don't know. But could that have been any more anticlimactic? I'm sure they just wanted to keep Aang the cute little pacifist who doesn't kill anybody and only fights in self-defense. But they managed to keep that image throughout the entire series, and they still managed to make the climax of Season 1 pretty epic. And that's on a cable network cartoon show. This is a big budget movie. So the day is saved. And Aang comes down from the city wall to find everyone participating in that obvious setup plot point from earlier that has absolutely nothing to do with the series. So Aang, deciding to finally accept becoming the Avatar, bows in the most awkward way with one of the most pained expressions I have ever seen on a human being. I mean, look at him! Could he be any more not this guy if he tried? The film finally ends on the hardest sequel bait they could muster, with Fire Lord Ozai recruiting Zuko's sister to hunt the Avatar down. Also squeezing in a combination of fuck you and plot point about the comet arriving. I do which we knew in the series by Episode 8, and explaining how it will somehow allow all firebenders to use their chi just like Iroh did. The end. Now let me be perfectly clear. I'm not saying that this is a bad movie. I'm saying this is a terrible movie. It's an insult to fans and just casual moviegoers alike. From just a strict moviegoer standpoint, the characters are wooden, unengaging, and never given a chance to develop. You could put almost any one of these characters in place of any of the others and have no impact on the narrative. And the plot is almost nonsensical. 
The characters just seem to go places and do things, and occasionally take place in set-piece action scenes. But none of it feels cohesive. In the end, it just ends up being people you don't know doing stuff you don't care about. The one upside is that the graphics for the film are pretty impressive, for the most part. While the bending itself looks pretty great, it feels completely disconnected from the actions of the characters, and the fantastical creatures from the series, which were often impactful in their own right, and really breathed life into this strange magical world, don't look all that great, and have very little similarity to their animated counterparts. From a fan standpoint, the movie becomes all the more atrocious. None of the characters are even remotely similar to how they were in the series. Numerous characters have been removed entirely. Entire important and just fan-favorite scenes and areas are either missing or have been combined into massive blobs of incoherence. What could have really helped this movie would have been to go the route of many book adaptations in previous years and have it broken into a series of smaller movies to allow time to develop the characters and work out all the key scenes that took place throughout the television series. But with writing like we're seeing here, that may not have helped all that much. Oh yeah, and not having changed strongly established canon parts like the names of the characters, or how bending works! All of this together really makes the desperate sequel bait at the end of the film hilariously sad, really. Luckily, that didn't happen. And if it ever does, I sincerely urge you to not see it and just let this die off. The best we can hope for at this point is for the animated universe to keep being awesome, and maybe some years down the road we'll get a more loyal reboot. Until then, if you have any interest at all in the Airbender franchise, I would highly suggest you watch the animated series. It may be a kid's show, but its great writing, characters, and animation shine far above this attempted cash-in, and it still holds up really well years later. So, consider yourselves informed. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm quickly realizing the follies of drinking a movie, and I think I need to get some medical attention. Until next time. So here's my opinion on this. Blah-dee-blah. Blah-dee-blah. Blah-dee-blah.